He was the one that uh, had the biggest crowds. They were instrumental in the pop music scene, but they aren't exactly household names. How the Dave Lewis combo made their musical mark. And meet the dedicated, organized, and passionate women of the Black Heritage Society. How they're preserving the past for the future. Plus, how one woman's battle with breast cancer led her to create a support group for minority women, also dealing with that sometimes deadly disease. These stories and more are up next on an all-new City Stream. Hi, and welcome to City Stream. I'm Penny Legate. We are here at the Northwest African American Museum in Seattle. What better place to help us celebrate Black History Month? This museum helps tell the story of what it means to be an African American in the Pacific Northwest. Through their interactive permanent displays, to their rotating main exhibits, not to mention the live performances and book clubs that also take place here, the Northwest African American Museum truly captures the heart and soul of African Americans for all of us to enjoy. Now, no one can completely understand Northwest history without taking a musical journey. And let's face it, Seattle's always been such a great music town. From Jackson Street Jazz to 60s rock and roll, we had the grunge sound, and then, of course, the unique sound of Jimi Hendrix as well. Well, there is one talent, though, that's often credited with being one of the most influential performers of our time in the whole Northwest scene. But it's a name, strangely enough, that you may not have heard before. His music went to number one, the sound of the Dave Lewis combo. In the 1950s and 60s, Seattle was still a city waiting to be discovered. By day, industry was booming. By night, there was a new kind of sound emanating from the clubs, the early roots of rock and roll. And at the top of the club scene was a local performer most of us have never heard of, Dave Lewis. Here's this guy, he was working five and six nights a week at these places and playing his own music and even putting it out on, on and selling records locally. People in music credit Lewis as being the godfather of Northwest rock and roll. He was a model for other groups to follow. They could hear that formula and they'd go, oh yeah, it's kind of a crossover into uh, jazz and R&B and rock. And he was hitting on a lot of things at, at once. So he was able to soak up a lot of people. The Jimi Hendrix, I could imagine that he was probably influenced by Dave Lewis, especially if he saw Joe Johansson. Joe Johansson was a killer blues guitar player. Music was hot in town. I mean, it was a big thing. And Dave was right in the mix of the club scene, you know. I mean, he was the one that uh, had the biggest crowds, the best crowds, and, you know, everybody was uh, hopping and dancing and loving it. Dave Lewis rose to local fame in the heart of Seattle's civil rights struggle. People marched in the streets. There were sit-ins at City Hall. But when it came to Lewis's music, perhaps that was the best demonstration that color simply did not matter. He was a steady influence in town. He, was, uh, he had all the good guys playing with him. You're listening to one of Lewis's greatest hits, Little Green Thing. And Lewis's signature song, Dave's Mood, probably inspired the most played local song of all, Louie Louie. Behind the Dave Lewis sound was his instrument of choice, the Hammond B3 organ. Buck England still remembers the sessions where he and Dave Lewis first connected. Dave Lewis, uh, his creation actually in Seattle that uh, really steered uh, most of the rock and roll bands. I got to do guest sit-ins with uh, Trio. Dave, he'd get uh, involved with too many women coming to check him out at the club and he'd take off and it'd leave me there to play the night. So it would be, you know, I would be the, the organ player for the night.
they don't make these B3 organs anymore, but England still plays gigs around town and routinely gets requests for Dave Lewis songs. Ironically, in the 60s, Seattle was never considered a music town. Those words even appear in one of Lewis's album notes. How those days have changed, and that Lewis album is now a collector's item. Dave Lewis slipped from greatness the way so many music artists do, by addiction. But people today remember Lewis only as a great musician he was, and the influence he had on the Northwest music scene. He had that kind of gift, kind of like King of the Jungle, and when he looked at you and smiled, you just felt automatically, boy, I, I'm gonna sign up. I'll vote for this guy. And that's, that's the kind of person he was. So that was, I think, part of his, his, uh, his success. If you'd like to learn more about Dave Lewis, all you have to do is log on to History Link, where you'll find a long and colorful profile. And some of the easiest ways to find those connections are on our website. It's seattlechannel.org slash citystream. When we come back, we'll continue our Black History Month special with a look at the important job of those who are preserving the past for the future. Have an idea for a city stream story? Just log on to our website at seattlechannel.org slash citystream. Click on the story idea link and send it our way. Then tune in Thursdays at 7 o'clock to catch the latest episode of City Stream. Collecting, organizing, and researching historical facts for exhibits such as this, which is called the Journey Gallery here at the Northwest African American Museum, can be a daunting task that takes so much time and energy. But volunteers with the Black Heritage Society are very passionate about preserving their stories for the future. Felix Bennell introduces us to this group and their energetic leader who has been keeping them going for more than a decade. I love it here and I think when I call up and I say this is Jackie, everybody seems to know who Jackie is and I, I appreciate that. And this beautiful Bible. Jackie is Jackie Lawson. Here is the Museum of History and Industry, where Jackie is helping make sure that Seattle's African American past has a future too. Maybe they are longshoremen or something. This 79 year old native Seattleite, grandmother, and historian is chair of the Collections Committee of the Black Heritage Society of Washington State. With help from a team of dedicated volunteers, She's responsible for taking care of the Society's priceless collection of local history. Did you list this? Every Friday, the group gathers at Mohai, where the Society's collection is housed, to work on sorting, researching, and documenting the stuff of history. I got interested in history probably in 76, when uh, Haley's book first came out. And someone said, why don't you go to the archives and see, uh, you know, find your grandfather. It never dawned on me, but I did go out to the archives, found Grandpa as a six-month-old baby, and that was it. I was bitten at that time. Jackie's research made previous generations of her family, once unknowable, come to life. I found out that his father and his mother were married legally in the courts during slave time in uh, 1814 in North Carolina and I actually have their marriage certificate. This is the kind of stuff I love, to find these great old documents and to know that they were really, they were real. These are real people. I asked Jackie whether she believes that because of what African Americans have had to endure in this country, if their history is somehow more important or more valuable. I think everybody's history is, is valuable to that family. Um, ours is different because it's more difficult to find. That history is a little easier to find now that some of it's on display at the new Northwest African American Museum. The majority of the collection remains at Mohai. Our, our collection, as you can see, expands all the way from photographs and small ephemera and little artifacts to something as large as this. This is a game table that was donated by um, the wife of the nephew of Russell Noodles Smith. 
It came from the Black and Tan nightclub, which was very popular in Seattle. It was right off of Jackson on 12th Avenue. Jackie's passion for preserving history is more than simple nostalgia. We all need to know from where we came um, so that we'll know what mistakes were made by our families, um, the good things that we did. There are so many of us that really don't know uh, the great things that our families did. And she has faith that the Black Heritage Society will preserve that priceless history for everyone. She's even donated her own family photos to the collection. I have faith in the Black Heritage Society even when I'm no longer working here. I know that it's gonna be taken care of. So I know that they're safe, so here's my family. You can see a lot of the photos and artifacts from the Black Heritage Society here at the Northwest African American Museum. And by the way, the group still meets regularly at Mohai. That museum also has several events around Black History Month. You can get all the details on our website. It's seattlechannel.org slash citystream. Learning you have breast cancer is a terrifying ordeal. But for one local survivor, her diagnosis gave her the strength to reach out to minority women to help bring them peace, courage, and even sisterhood as they each wage their own individual battles. Megan Erb has our story. I asked the doctor what was my chances with the chemo or without, and he said 50-50. So I said, well, then I don't want to do the chemo anymore. I felt like I was in it alone, even though I wasn't. I didn't have my husband there. And I was raising, you know, our son alone. So that was hard, trying to deal with the chemo and being sick and weak and not able to, you know, take care of him like I want to. Well, at the time of my diagnosis, um, I had a lot of anxiety, um, a lot of what now, what will be, how do I deal with this? Bridget Hempstead was a young mother of three daughters. The youngest one was just two years old when their mom celebrated her 35th birthday. It was a birthday Bridget will never forget. After uh, my mammogram showed that there was something wrong and uh, they told me to go see a surgeon right away, I went home and I looked in the mirror and I told my breast, you got to go because <laughs> you're not going to kill me. And with that attitude, Bridget moved forward with her life, now going down a new path. Once I got through the fact that, yeah, I have breast cancer and if it's God's will for me to um, go um, at this age, then it's his will. But. If not, I'll do whatever I can um, to help somebody else. I started educating everyone that I saw. I got on the phone, I called all my friends, I talked to people on the street, and I said, do you know about breast cancer? Do you know about breast cancer in the African American community? In fact, Bridget studied so much about her disease, treatments, and what it all meant for her that she felt comfortable discussing it with her doctors, friends, family, and even fellow patients. Um, my doctors began to ask me, well, can you talk to another woman because she's going through and she did not go through well. She's not dealing with this very well. Pretty soon, she started meeting with breast cancer patients one-on-one. -on -one. But as word spread about Bridget's counseling, more doctors asked her to speak to their patients. Then it became where a lot of doctors were sending their patients to me. And so we started meeting at Starbucks in Columbia City. Nowadays, Starbucks has been replaced with a bigger venue. So what I'd like for us to do is just kind of do some check-in and see how everybody's doing. Why don't we start with you, Miss Mabel? 
Bridget's group, the Sierra Sisters, is in its 16th year of helping African American and other minority women deal with the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. I didn't know anybody, um, none of my uh, friends at the time, uh, none of them had ever experienced any type of breast cancer, so I was feeling kind of lost. Wear your survivorship as a badge of honor. A referral from the American Cancer Society sent so Dee Turner to a Sierra Sisters meeting. <laughs> yeah, I've been able to see with my own two eyes women living with cancer. I've been able to see women deal with it, live with it, cry with it. For two-time cancer survivor Mary Agard, the group helped ease her fears about cancer returning again. It takes away most of my fears. Take away most of my fears because, you know, I would be wondering what happened if it came back in another part of my body. Then if I get a headache, I would be scared, saying, I hope it's not going up in my brain. And, and Sarah's sister helped me to release all of that fear. The Sierra sisters meet once a month and have a guest speaker talk about a range of different topics, including reconstructive surgery, ovarian cancer, patients' bill of rights, and much more. Oh, our monthly meetings are full of knowledge, full of love, full of support, um, lots of information, and, um, and we're there, we, we pray. Um, we uh, believe in um, supporting one another. It's like a family, We're like all family, because my family really wasn't there, you know. Um, it was just a blessing mentally, because I don't know how I would have did without them. Sally Frederick became a Sierra sister at the beginning of her diagnosis in April 2004. After a few sessions of chemo, my hair started. I started losing my hair and I got very scared and just frustrated. And I told Bridget, I said, you know, Bridget, I'm just, I can't, I can't stand to see this. I said, I'm just tired. So the Sierra sisters held a hair shaving party in her honor. And they had this beautiful chair and this beautiful pink towel, and there was food everywhere, candles and women just, we were just there to celebrate. And they were like, this is all for you. This is for you, you want to sit, relax. As I was sitting there, and as each stroke, as it was going, I just said, Lord, I'm going this battle. I'm going to go through whatever I have to go through to live, to survive. I have a little boy that he needs his mother. And I'll do whatever it takes to get through this because I want to see him grow up, you know, and become somebody. Uh, one of the things that we've, we help with is even getting through the end of life. And unfortunately, because we are in such a war, and this is a war, uh, fighting breast cancer, fighting any kind of cancer, uh, we have casualties. And, um, and, you know, we're here to help even through that, as painful as it may be. Oh, I like these hugs. Oh, I do like these. While pain may be something the Sierra sisters are dealing with, they refuse to let it define them. Don't never give up. Even though they tell you you have cancer, it's not until death, until you die, so you can beat it. I see myself like, wow, you know, like that used to be me. And now look where I am. You know, I've, I've gone this battle, I've went through, and here I am now on the other side. And when I see other people come in, I want to give them what I was given, you know, all the love and the support. And our hopes is that um, being a part of um, life and promoting living life to the fullest, that there's something inside of that woman that won't give up. Um, a woman should never stop living.
The Sierra Sisters meet once a month at the Rainier Community Center, and those meetings are open to all women and their supporters. Now on February 25th, that's a Saturday night, they're going to have a big black tie fundraiser, and they're going to raise money for breast cancer research and also be celebrating their 16 years as an organization. More information is on our website. It's seattlechannel.org slash citystream. Are you on the go? Then take CityStream with you. Log on to seattlechannel.org or iTunes to sign up for podcasts of every CityStream episode. Then download them to your mobile device and never miss a show. Before we go, let's take a sneak peek at what's coming up on our next city stream. We'll take a look at the day in the life of a unique downtown Seattle shop, Bernie Ute's Hat. How this mom and pop shop keeps customers looking their finest with a new cap or two. And a prize winning photographer turns his lens from hard news to a more savory subject. Plus we'll flip through the pages of a unique new bookshop in town. One that's sure to tantalize your taste buds. Hey, if you're looking for something fun to do, come on out to the Northwest African American Museum. I think you'll really like the current exhibit here. It's very colorful. Seattle native Zenobia Bailey's exhibit, The Aesthetics of Funk, features crochet works of art that explore the ways that style, history, and spirituality intersect. This fascinating exhibit runs now through May 6th. The museum is open Wednesdays through Sundays, and admission is free the first and second Thursdays of every month. Well, that wraps up this week's show. And remember, if you want more information about any of the stories that you've seen in this program, all you need to do is go to our website. I know you have it memorized by now. It is seattlechannel.org slash citystream. And if you're not our friend yet on Twitter or Facebook, now is the time to sign up. Well, we certainly hope you've enjoyed this special episode celebrating Black History Month. I'm Penny Legate for CityStream. I'll see you next time.